Larry Constantine, Night Matchella, Black Prince from the British Empire. Cricket was his life, and through the game, this grandson of a slave won great fame. Born in Trinidad in all humility, he rose to the ranks of high degree. Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry. On ever bully body line, honesty and integrity are the sum total of Sir Larry. So varied and distinguished was his career, cricketer, dynamic and debonair, called to the degree of the utter bar. He later became high commissioner. Sportsman, politician, and diplomat. On the race relations board, he calls how's that? Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry, on ever body body line. By his efforts, he paves the way. He points this night to a new day. The name of Leary Constantine has been well known in this country for 40 years. He is a man who has not been content to rest on his reputation as a great cricketer. He has served in high office in the West Indies and has won admiration and respect in Britain. In the strict sense of the term, Constantine is an immigrant, but he is among the most distinguished immigrants ever to come to Britain from the Commonwealth. Louis Nkosi is a young writer from South Africa who has chosen to leave his own country and is unlikely ever to be able to return. He is of the new generation of Negro intellectuals. He has been a fellow at Harvard and is now making a living as a novelist, playwright and journalist in London. These two men from widely different backgrounds have one obvious thing in common. They are coloured men living and prospering in a white community. Um, I remember one conference I attended in Copenhagen where a number of scholars pointed out the fact that the Negro world is in revolt against uh, the European system of values, at least some of them. Uh, now it seems to me that this uh, brings out certain crucial facts about a man like you or me living in this society, yeah. which is a white society also governed by a European system of values. Uh, doesn't this induce some kind of schizophrenia? Uh, in us. Well, it's, there's bound to be a conflict and it's going to be worse in my case than it is in yours. Because my forefathers went out as slaves. They destroyed everything that was African amongst the slaves. They didn't even let them hold their names. They didn't let them cook their type of foods. They didn't allow them to use their type of utensils. So that they destroyed the African background entirely so that if as Africans we live in the West Indies we are therefore taught how to forget Africa and I think one of the great things in my life is that I have not forgotten Africa and I never will forget Africa your family name Constantine where does that come from well we really don't know we have never been able to discover all the children of slaves used to take the name of the slave master and where the slave master was not a very kind person they used to take the name of the person next door which was a sort of reflection on the slave on the master I suppose Constantine came from some background like that but tell me about about Trinidad the, the, the country you come from it, um, one is always given a romantic picture about about the West Indies uh, islands in the Sun yeah. and people being cheerful and running perhaps naked you know in the streets the question of children running in the streets that used to happen a long time ago it doesn't happen now there's no child you can meet on the street now naked everybody's gone so proud and uh, we come we have a good climate we don't go above 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit at any time the country is luscious. 
We have all the fruits and vegetables that you can find in any part of the tropics. You have the more sophisticated areas of the city of Port of Spain, for instance, and within 10 minutes of being in Port of Spain, you're right in the country of Digger Martin, of St. Anne's, of Belmont, of Santa Cruz and so on, all beautiful parts in the country where you have a lot of trees, a lot of grass and a lot of water. And I don't believe there's anything as nice as green grass and trees and water in any part of the world. There is an exuberant vitality about a nation which is a pepper pot of races. Negro, European, Indian, Chinese. The Trinidadian lives as he pleases and lets live. Port of Spain, the capital, is rapidly developing into a busy mid-Atlantic city. Supermarkets, British cars, American tourists. Yet behind the present day boom lies the kind of history that is common in the Caribbean. Spain owned Trinidad first, Walter Raleigh raided it, Britain pocketed the island from the Spanish. Constantine's world was outside the big city. This was the village his grandparents came to when they escaped from slavery, no one quite knows where, and found a new life in Trinidad. And this, only slightly changed, is the house where they lived. They brought with them their Catholic faith. Constantine, as a boy, was brought up in two firm disciplines. Catholicism was one, cricket the other. This is the village where he was born, as it looked 60 years ago. Here in 1902, he was christened Leary Nicholas. Nicholas after the saint, Leary after an Irish cricketer. His family made some headway. His father managed an estate, but Constantine was still an unprivileged boy in a white man's world. I could go back to one period when I was four or five years old, when I was playing on the streets in Maraval, when my mother heard the horses coming up and it meant that the overseers were riding their horses to the estate. And I could remember the fear in my mother's house when a voice when she called us out of the street with this phrase, get out of the street, the white man will pass on you. And I believe that has left an impression that has taken years and years and years to wipe out. I, I'm intrigued by that because um, I come from uh, South Africa, a, a country notorious for its uh, race policies. I think that it was about 11 or 12 years um, when I, I became conscious of white power and I, was, I, I watched policemen uh, slapping Africans about in the streets and, and suddenly uh, I was conscious that this was a, a world, a wide world to which I was a foreigner and, and, and it was there to trap me and, and, and to impose its domination on me. Well, you surprised me. You were, you were 11 years when you saw it. I became conscious of it at five years old. I have never forgotten the fear in my mother's voice. And that has remained with me. And the first thing that I remember is that white people can be cruel. When I was growing up in South Africa, cricket uh, as sport was slightly uh, comic to us yes uh, it was um, it was a sport for snobs uh, football yes th this was the masculine sport uh, and a little rough you know uh, sport for the people yeah uh, how how did you get into cricket uh, as a black man how how did it even come to you how did it get to the west indies well those same those same managers on the estates were English in most cases. And they would have a pitch in which they practiced their cricket, they got their implements from England, and they played their game. And then they would teach the natives how to bowl. And the natives would begin to bowl. But the Englishmen or the white men hadn't uh, enough in numbers to make up teams. And therefore, gradually, the local black man began to play against the local white man. And You mean the, the white master used to teach the slaves play cricket? Yes, he hadn't enough of them to play. That's a vastly intriguing. Uh, uh, yes, very intriguing, but it was, and uh, they used to be very sporty. You would find a hard taskmaster at a job who was as pleasant and kind on the cricket field as you could want him. Yes, but why was it cricket 
rather than rugby, for instance, that was taught to the slaves. Do they think that uh, it wouldn't be a good idea if the slaves tackled the masters? No, but to rugby in that day, in those days, was more a, 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 a game for Oxford and Cambridge, <laughs> so, so that uh, they wouldn't play rugby until very late in the West Indies. But uh, cricket is a proletarian game in the West Indies. Everybody plays cricket, on the beach, on the sands, everywhere. West Indies has produced many cricketers, Hedley Worrell, Walcott, Weeks and Sobers, and many others too numerous to name, who likewise have achieved a claim. Those widely sung little pals of mine, but none quite like Larry Constantine. Constantine was an all-rounder, aggressive batsman, fast bowler, brilliant field. He played for the West Indies in England in 1923, again in 28, and played in test series twice in the 30s. There are many with better records in the books, but he played the kind of cricket that people remember and relish. He was the authentic demon bowler, electric heels, the fastest thing they said that the cricket field had ever witnessed. He was the sort of cricketer the newspapers and the newsreels loved. Neil Cardus wrote, there are no bones in his body, only great charges and flows of energy. When he hits the ball for six, he laughs hugely and seems to say, Oh golly, I like it. Let me do it again. I was a terrific reader of English history, cricket history. I knew everybody's name that mattered. I used to picture what they were like. Sometimes we saw pictures. And when they were walking out at Lord's to bat, you used to feel the thrill for them. And then suddenly, you were walking out at Lord's to bat. And I can tell you, as you were going down the stairs, you felt all-powerful. You felt like two men walking into bat. And as you got out of the pavilion and you got on the grass, you became smaller and smaller and smaller, until by the time you reached the pitch, you had almost disappeared and then you suddenly catch hold of yourself and you say, after all, I ought to be equal to this. And you put your best foot forward. And when you have made a few runs and you've gone back to the pavilion, it's common to stand up on the balcony and look along again to look where you have been. And sometimes to think, I could die now. In 1929, Constantine became professional cricketer at Nelson in Lancashire. Nelson plays in the Lancashire League, where the town teams consist of ten local men and one star professional. They see no reason in Lancashire why the best players in the world shouldn't come and play for them. Nelson liked the look of Constantine. He signed his contract and came north. Nelson is a far cry from Trinidad. It is changed now, but in Constantine's day, it was a town of cotton and clogs, a product of the Industrial Revolution that transformed the north into a Klondike a hundred years ago. Yet it is a part of England where a vigorous and self-standing individualism goes down well, and where there is a tremendous pride in what the North can do and achieve. And there is pride too in the graceful and beautiful countryside round about that the Industrial Revolution did not touch, and which the Southerner never seems to know about, or to want to know. Constantine played for Nelson through the Depression years of the 1930s, when the cotton industry was on short time and short money. But for sixpence on a Saturday afternoon, you could see cricket played as well as anywhere in the world. Constantine, or Connie as everyone called him, brought glamour, crowds and success to the cricket field, and the people of Nelson loved him for it. It brings back happy memories. What was the role of the... A professional cricketer in, in league cricket? He was this, the sort of backbone of the side. He had to bowl, he had to field, he had to coach the players, he had to guide them all through the game. And he had a captain who knew something about it. And with his help, then 
you could create a winning side out of what perhaps would otherwise be a mediocre side. Outside the sporting circles, how did you and your family find the people of Nelson? At first, you know, the strangeness, what we discovered later on to be strangeness, creates that uh, you people behave in a certain way on that account. We thought at one time it was prejudice, and we took that as true. But after two years, everything turned the other way, and from then on, we were the happiest strangers you had in Nelson, if we could be called strangers. Does that actually mean that you were invited into their homes? Oh, yes. And, and you invited them oh, back into yes. yours? And they could pull our leg, too. I remember going into a house when the lady, a very nice lady, Mrs. Much, said to us, don't touch the chocolate cake. I borrowed it from next door. And I thought she was serious. She wanted to return it untouched. So I didn't take this cake when in those days I was very partial to chocolate cake. You, you had uh, children, or, or at least one child. I had one daughter. Did you, did you send her to school here? Yes, she was the, we used to call her the only fly in the ointment. She was the only dark student at the secondary school in Nelson. She must have found a certain amount of trouble with the children, who, even if they were not prejudiced, had never seen a colored girl before. And, um, what kind of stories did she bring home? Oh, she brought home a lot of stories, but the point is that before Gloria went to the secondary school, she had gone to Miss Washington's school, she had gone to the convent, and therefore people knew her and knew her father, if even they didn't speak to her. But then, when she went to the school, she was quite comfortable. She used to come and tell us that a, a conductor on the bus told her that uh, if she doesn't smile, he's going to come home and, uh, and talk to her father and stay for tea, and if her father didn't like what he was saying, he was going to stay for dinner, and all that sort of a thing. But she was very happy. The record at Nelson is a joy to read. Ten wickets, ten runs, bowling at speed. And 192 in brilliant hits, which he scored in 87 minutes. Bowling like a devil at demon pace, he batted like an angel in a state of grace. Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry, I never bowled a body line. Every match he gave his best, whether Lancashire League or Oval Test. The Nelson team and the Nelson spectators had had a bean feast of good cricket with the happiest bunch of boys you ever saw on a cricket team. Out of nine seasons, we won the championship on seven occasions, four running, and we were runners-up on two occasions, losing it by one point on each occasion. I had a man yesterday, an old man, say that uh, that the people here these days who play cricket play it like a bunch of old women. I wonder, what, what do you think? I mean, has, has cricket changed a great deal since you, the time you were playing here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. When, when I was here, we played to win. It didn't matter what the other side did. We played to beat them so that we were always preferring to bat last unless we knew that the wicket was going to break up. Otherwise, we helped to break it up by batting on it first and putting them on it, but we were playing to win all the time. To come back to your life here in Nelson at the time that you arrived, do you think that uh, it was a great strain for you, a great burden um, to live as a black man in, in, in this town? Well, I think we, we must admit that being the first professional, coloured professional cricketer who has come to Lancashire League, that I had a job to do uh, to satisfy people that I was as human as they were and that I reacted to things as other human beings do and that I had to set an example. So, in truth and in fact, I carried a burden. But I was helped tremendously by my wife 
I will never stop thanking her for the contribution she has made to my life. And when I was prepared to run, she said, no, we can't live this sort of life in our own country, Leary. Let us stick it and see what comes out of it. When I was prepared to leave. So, Larry, um, I must tell you that, um, that this is not the attitude that is shared by younger people from the colonies who arrive in this country, the young African or the West Indian colored man who comes into this country today just doesn't uh, begin to understand this notion uh, that if he's here, he has to represent, say, about 90 million other black people around the world. I accept the responsibility for what I'm doing, but only as an individual. Don't you think that this was a rather unfair uh, responsibility to have to shoulder? Not at all. I think that's history. That's how history is made. I mean, I felt as a pioneer, and I'm quite sure I was right, in believing as a pioneer, I had to leave something creditable behind. If you say that you don't feel that you should make that sort of contribution, I don't, uh, I don't regard that as being bad at all. What I say is, you have not got this pioneering spirit. But you must be conscious of the fact that after you have left, it wouldn't be easy for anybody to follow you. If you're conscious of that, then that's all right. I'm not going to grumble. Yes, but uh, uh, using the hindsight that we have of Smethwick yes. and a great deal of racial feeling that we, we can see in the country today, do you think that you made a dent at all I mean, on, the, on the English prejudice, such as it was at, in, in those days? Hasn't it gone from from bad to worse, in fact? No, in areas, in areas it may be. But could you come to Nelson and say that Nelson is a place that you will get a reaction as you get in Smethwick about colored people? Of course not. Every time a man walks the street in Nelson, a colored man walks the street, they look at him and wonder where he comes from. But there's a certain amount of regard for his feeling in Nelson, which, although you don't get in Smethwick, but you might get in Smethwick if there was another man who started in Smethwick as I started here and made a contribution to easy living and easy understanding and tolerance amongst his own people and the, the, the indigenous peoples. That's how I see it. There is one other part of Lancashire that has left a deep impression on Constantine's life and to which he still goes back. Liverpool, where he worked as a welfare officer for the Ministry of Labour during the war. Well, we're moving into Liverpool now. Uh, the years of the war, bitter years, working in factories. It must have been a terrible time in Liverpool. And you had the choice to go back to the West Indian Islands if you wanted to. Why did you stay? Well, I couldn't run away. I, I think I've said it in many, on many occasions before. I had got a standard of life in England that I could never have achieved in my country. I had made a lot of friends. England, to me, stood for something. And now that war had started, I would have felt like a little dog to have run away from England and go and sit in the safety. And that's even then it couldn't be guaranteed the safety of my country in the West Indies. My wife and my daughter and myself, we sat down and we talked it over and we decided to stay in England during that period. And we are happy that we did. 